All right, hello everyone. I'm here. I'm back. Uh, sorry for taking a little bit of a longer break from the week I've been trying to hit. I went out to a tournament on Saturday, uh, and this is but this is not a report of that tournament. This is a preview to Fight Night 2021, uh, which is an event I'm very excited to watch, and I think can also teach us a lot about what standard looks like at the moment in the 21.06 meta. Um, so let's start with what is Fight Night. Ooh. Uh, so, Fight Night is three of some of the most active metas, get to go head-to-head -head in a King of the Hill style format. So each team has four players, each team, or each player on that team plays until they lose, and the last team standing wins that Fight Night. Um, and then each deck has to present a different archetype, and each team must ban at least three factions per side, the way that the official events word is a little bit different from that, but uh, I think this is that's a decent enough approximation. And the other thing is the deck lists are submitted in advance, which is why I get to do this video. Um, so in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the decks that both team that all three teams built, um, and and talk a little bit about um, you know how they're winning and how they're shaping the standard environment at the moment. So, what's interesting about this, there are 12 players participating. They are probably in the top 25 players in the world right now. Um, and so getting to see a team, this team, these three different teams of people to f try and solve the meta, build decks, and then play against each other is a huge, it's a great learning experience and a great way to get a snapshot of the meta. So each of these different pools has a different read on the best decks. We can see why, what choices people make and what that maybe tells us about what they're thinking about in terms of the meta. Um, and also these are going to be streamed. Not by me, I'm not, I'm just participating in this as an observer. Um, but Vale is going to have details up soon and when they, when they do, I will update um, the links below with information about the stream or eventually links to VODs. Um, so, I want to break down some of the different archetypes that we see, because as I mentioned before, there's going to be different archetypes, and different people are going to have different senses. Now, thinking about this just sort of uh, from the topmost level, you could say, oh, well, if we're in a meta where there's a lot of things that are really good, we would expect each of these different groups, and I should say the, what these groups are, they're the Snare Bears, which is a New York City-based group, the Process, which is a UK-based testing group, and New World Erder, which is a, I think, primarily Germany-based testing group. Um, so these three groups are going to be going on, going against each other. Um, and you, th you can think about it like if the meta is really defined by a single deck or a small, a very small set of decks, we do expect to see a lot of overlap in between um, the teams. Also, if the meta is very, but then if within you know a sort of deck level if there's a lot of diversity we might expect to see a lot of variety and so what we actually see when we look at these standard lists is that runners there seems to be basically an almost complete consensus about what the best runners are and what sort of tiers they're in in that there's an obvious top three runners maybe the ordering of them is dependent on the on the team and then sort of a fourth choice that two of them agree on, one of them disagree on. But then when we get to corpse, we actually see a lot of disagreement about what the best corpse are, which I think will be a very interesting thing to talk about. So the runner side breakdown is APOC Lou, Hive Mind Max, and 419. All three teams have a deck that's one of these three. Um, or sorry, all three teams have a copy of these decks. So there are three APOC Lou's, three Hive Mind Maxes, and three 419s. Then two of the teams have an APOC Tau list, and the final team, the New World Order, has the Sunny list. And we'll go over all of these deck lists in just a moment. But this is very constrained. And you can think about it saying APOC Lou, Hive Mind Max, and 419, all, no one thinks that they can do better than these three lists. And then the APOC Tau and Sunny, there's some consensus that APOC Tau is maybe the second de best deck, but maybe it's the Sunny, or maybe there's something else that these teams didn't find or didn't think was consistent. Um, but then for the corpse side, we see a much bigger variety. So Precision Design Rush is 
if you had asked me before seeing these lists, I would have said, oh yeah, this is for sure the strongest deck in the format, but not every team is running a, a version of PD Rush. Uh, if you had asked me after this Saturday in the, in the store champs I played in New York City, I would have said, well, Sports Metal is as good as Precision Design Rush, but only there are two Sports Metals deck, and only one of them I think is really the, the incredibly strong version. Um, so um, that'll be interesting to see. And then we see a lot of variety. I have BTL Rush, Fast Advancing Combo. One of those is secretly an outfit that I misread initially when making these slides. Um, there's actually three different versions of CTM. Two of them are Boom, one of them is an MCA. Uh, we have a Boom, Asa, and then also sort of a Tempo Asset Spam NEH. So we've got a much wider diversity of corps and much less agreement on what the best corps are, which I think is really interesting because uh, up into 21.06, we were seeing a 60% corp win rate meta and everyone was like, Precision Design is the best deck. Um, and then maybe also Combo Built to Last is the best deck. Um, and so now we're in a little bit more of Wild West and these teams came to slightly different conclusions about what the best decks are. But I want to sort of start by saying, you know, the, the way I think about this is there's kind of tiers of decks and the top tier of Corp decks and the top tier of Runner decks shape both each other and every other deck below them has to have a response to those top decks. So I'm going to, so I'm going to actually start with talking about the two top Corp decks as I view it. And then the runner decks all are responding to those two decks. And then all of the corps are basically trying to respond to those runner decks, which are in turn responding to the very top corp decks. And that's sort of the cycle of, of what the Netrunner meta looks like, at least from my perspective. And I'm going to note and start here by saying this is one of those cases where I'm most likely to be very wrong about stuff. I haven't talked with any of these teams that much about these decks. Uh, you know, I've talked with some of the snare bears because many of them were at the event I was at last Saturday about some of these decks, but they didn't, none of this data was public at the time, so they didn't talk with me about it. Um, so there are basically on this slide, I have um, the precision design lists on the left, one from New World Order, one from the process, and then um, from the snare bears, uh, I have this no ice plus five sports medal. So um, for those of you that don't play a lot of standard, uh, this precision design list is basically startup legal and I think very, very good in startup. The idea is you have a Cyberdeck Sandbox and Offworld Office and Luminal Transubstantiation, all of which gain you tempo when you score those agendas. And you're almost always scoring them using seamless launch and then using precision design to recur that seamless launch to keep your tempo up. You make a single remote and you make it um, very annoying to get into using Manigarm Skunk Works and Anoetic Void. Um, and that's basically the whole deck. There's some small differences between the two, but you can see they have the same eight agenda suites. They have slightly different assets and I do a better job on later slides of highlighting these differences. But largely we see NGOs, Rashidas, Spin Doctors. We see largely the same set of ice the same exact operations and largely the same upgrades. You see small quantity tweaks. We see a macrophage in the processes list that's missing from New World Order. We see one anoetic void to two border controls for New World Order and one border control and two anoetic voids for the process. So just small differences in what these two different teams want. The process is looking more at setting up that impenetrable scoring remote with anoetic void. Um, because Anoetic Void and Manigarm Skunk Works work together, but Border Control and Anoetic Void do not. But the extra Border Control means that you can put that on a central so that you can prevent an Apocalypse, which is in two of the major sort of defining meta runner decks. And then this list on the right is a sports medal list. And a lot of people, when they look at the sports medal list, they go, this looks very thin. How does this win? And the idea with the Swartz Metal list is it just says you can steal some of my agendas, but you probably have to steal six or seven agendas to win. You have to steal five, six, or maybe worst case, like seven agendas to win the game. And Sports Metal only has to score three to four to win the game. 
This deck can fast advance a Vacheron from, I think it's from two credits, if there's a Res Jeeves on the board. Um, this deck is very tenacious and very hard to keep down, um, and uh, it relies on very different tech than the Precision Design list if you're trying to really stuff it with tech. And so that's part of the reason that why the Swartz Metal deck is good. Not because it's like intrinsically good, like you can't build a deck to counter it. Like I went and built a deck to counter it and I think it would work. Again, you know, I played a single test game, that's not really science, but like you can think of ways you can beat the Swartz Metal deck. It's thinking of ways you can beat the Swartz Metal deck and the Precision Design list that have very diametrically opposed sort of pulling forces on the runner. Where the Precision Design list seem to be able to contest a remote very, very quickly, very early. And Sports Metal is saying, you need to be able to trash agendas, you need to be able to disrupt my combo plans, and you need to not access my one-pointers. Um, and you also can't let me just contest a board by going wide. So it's it's some very different sort of looks for these two lists, and that is sort of the strength. They, they pull runners apart in two directions. So in response to primarily this precision design list, but I think it also works to some degree against the sports metal list, is Hive Mind Max, which to me is the strongest runner deck in the format. Um, 419 I think has a good argument for also for being at basically the same power level, um, but I think Hive Mind Max is a little more resilient against the variety of, of game plans. But it's a little more fragile and a little more draw order dependent. So there's a little more variance in the max list. So here I've done what I, uh, you know, I think what's ho hopefully a useful demonstration of just lining up all of the cards that are the same so you can see the differences between these three teams' lists. And I shuffle around the order, uh, which maybe is more confusing than it's worth, but I figured it'd be nice that way I don't just talk about one list or the other first. I've put out a very long video of Pinsel talking about the Hive Mind Max, and the list basically hasn't changed much. There's been a lot of cuts of single cards and then adding them back in and back out, um, and people end up in different places. So, you know, you can see, for example, each of these teams ended up on a different number of knob curries, um, but a lot of them ended up with the same basic foundations. Um, you know, this list is looking to draw a lot using, they're all playing I've Had Worse. These two decks are playing Earthrise Hotel. It looks like the Snare Bears decided to use Gotcha Pond instead of Earthrise Hotel as a sort of a pseudo draw. Uh, we've got Simul Chips, Amakua, Conduit, Tranquilizer, and Rebirth. So all of the influence is spent exactly the same between these decks. And basically, the goal is eventually they're going to get a big Hive Mind rig, they're going to get a big Amakua down, or a big Conduit down, or one of the cool things that this list does that's um, one of the things you, you kind of have to learn to do is go for the infinite imp with imp and knob curry uh, to just sort of trash the corpse ways of actually winning the game out of their hand while you then rebuild for your big conduit dig to actually go and win the game. So there's, you know, here there's a couple of small differences. So the process is including a clot, and presumably this is because they were worried about some fast advance stack. And we can also see snare bears. The team that's using the fast advance uh, precision design list is also using a clot. I, th you know, probably in response to some of their own testing. I think interestingly, the process that I re recall doesn't have a fast advance list, but I think has some inkling that there might be a fast advance list around. Um, the New World Order does not have that uh, or order, and we see that um, the process also cut an MK, and that's you know arguably where they put the clot. But they also have, you know, a wildcat strike that no one else has, or only on one knob curry instead of two or three. Um, so there's lots of like small little numbers tweaks, and I think, you know, if you're thinking about playing this half by max list yourself, you could try any of these three lists, and I think they're all going to work pretty well. The snare bears one, I'm have the most questions about. It's got the the weirdest suite of three gotcha pawns and two retrieval runs, which I think is an interesting idea, though I'm not sure if it solves a problem that I have had when playing the Hive Mind Max a lot, especially when you think about the fact that they're cutting the daily casts and the Earthrise Hotel. But I'll be interested to see how these different maxes play. So then we get to the other sort of canonical best deck in the format, uh, or one of the best decks in the format, uh, which is this 419 list. And there's a, actually, you can see a lot of variation in between these 419 lists, but the core of them is actually, like, they, these lists look more different than they're going to play. The core is Bravado, 
divert, dirty laundry, diversion of funds, deuces wild, you know, sure gamble, boomerang, um, daily cast, and earth rise. And then the turning wheel is the way this deck wants to win the late game. So all of these 419 lists, and eventually I should probably do a 419 video, they're looking to sort of just outvalue the corp early. So it's just saying you can't ever get ahead of me on money. I'm going to use bravado. I'm going to use dirty laundry. I'm going to use diversion of funds to always keep the economic advantage in my favor. And eventually I will install a turning wheel and just start single accessing HQ, single accessing R&D until I can build up enough counters that I can win the game in one turn by accessing a bunch of cards at once. Or if I think you're holding a bunch of agendas, I can access a bunch at the right time um, and doing that sort of stuff. Um, we can see a couple of small interesting differences. So we see that both the process and new world order are on mutual favors, whereas snare bears, it looks like they basically put in inside jobs in those, or I'm sorry, legworks in those slots. I think inside job is probably the actual direct replacement for it. So they're using inside jobs um, to count as basically two copies of a breaker, whereas the process is saying, oh, well, that's two mutual favors. And I think these cards are somewhat interchangeable. The snare bears inside job, I think is very nice against precision design. But it's going to be a little bit less nice maybe in other situations where you want a mutual favor. Uh, and the snare bears are also running a legwork and they've basically told me this is tech for the sports metal list because the idea is um, often if you're just trying to single access HQ against the sports metal, even if you steal an agenda, that actually usually puts the sports metal deck list ahead. And so the legwork allows you to steal and if they choose to draw, you can keep stealing, uh, which is really one of the most important ways to disrupt that deck. We also see a difference in whether you use Anacam or Diesel, um, and we'll see the you see the list with Anacam is running slightly more events, though not significantly more. Um, we see that NWE decided to go with Unity, save themselves four dollars, but spend two influence on it, which I think is an interesting choice. Um, and then just you know. Um, the process is going very safe for a lot of different decks by running a one, one of Citadel Sanctuary and a one of Hunting Grounds. Just handles a lot of uh, kind of tech and frustrating ice. Um, but I think it looks like the New World Order and Snare Bears decided that the decks that typically that's most useful on just don't don't seem to be as part as much part of the meta. Um, and we see stuff like oh, Snare Bears seems to be worried about more assets because they have an extra copy of Miss Bones relative to the New World Order. Uh, everyone's on two class act. Everyone, actually, not everyone is on three Earthrise Hotel, which is interesting to me at least. Well, I guess they're getting their draw in other places. And we see that only Snare Bears is on Rebirth, uh, which I think is an interesting thing. It wasn't something we were seeing a lot in Criminal before system update release, but I think now with Steve as a possibility, um, it's that's presumably why Snare Bears have it in there. Okay, and we're on to, I think, the final, like, meta-defining runner deck, which is this Apocalypse Lou. Um, and this list is just, I'm going to APOC you quickly, I'm going to rebirth into Omar quickly. Um, because I'm a 40-card deck, that's, like, the whole point of this. Rene Lou, there's, you know, you know, there's nothing in any of these lists that allows you to trash cards for cheaper. You're trashing... Lou only triggers if you trash an asset that you happen to access, and most of the assets you're going to trash are probably going to be with Apocalypse, not by accessing them. Um, and these lists look very, very similar, right? They're basically exact duplicates of each other. Like, the program suits are almost exactly the same, except that Snare Bears is running one less copy of each program and no Botulai, uh, is it, and they're instead running three zeros. Um, you know, and they're on 2A POC instead of 3, 2A soft instead of 1. So there's lots of these small variations. Um, and I think one of the interesting things for this list is how they're planning to compensate for if they if something gets messed up with their apocalypse. Um, so the the process is using a one of amped up, and so that's going to give them a bunch of extra clicks on the turn where they need to apoc if they've been like hit with a border control. They can play amped up and then finish off their apocalypse. Um, the New World Order instead used out of the ashes for pretty much the same effect. They get one free run a game. Um, and, you know, with moshing, they'll have a lot of opportunities to get that in the bin. Uh, Snare Bears actually doesn't have any of that tech. Instead, I think they're trying to power through their deck a little bit more consistently with zero and going much less 
on the labor right on the moshings and using labor rights to recur their non-program pieces, uh, which is I think a very interesting choice. Um, one thing I'll note in all these lists, there's a one of Stargate. But basically the idea is after you apocalypse, you can install the Stargate the next turn and start destroying the corp, probably favoring trashing ice over trashing almost anything else. Um, you don't care if the corp builds up agendas in HQ, you just want to make sure they don't get to recover on the board. So this, this Lou deck, this 419 deck, and Hive My Max are sort of defining the runner side. So as a corp, you need to be able to answer this late game inevitability that is this max list. Eventually they will have an Amakua with five, six, seven strength and be able to click on a conduit and access four, five, six, seven extra cards in R&D. Um, and in the meantime, they'll be able to really attack your remotes aggressively using Tranquilizer, Botulus, and, and um, Chisel. So, uh, but it sets up a little bit slowly. So you want to be able to disrupt them and force them to use tools early rather than late. Then you have this 419 list that really pressures you early and set, you know, tries to, if you try and score too aggressively when you can't, it's going to diversion of fun to you and then kind of grind you out with the turning wheel and boomerangs um, just to keep you off your toes in the early game and stretch it out to the point where it can, can secure an inevitable late game. And then we have Lou that says, oh, if you try and rush me out, I'm going to blow up your whole board and we'll start playing over again. And I can do this more. I've built my whole deck to do that. So I will probably do it better than you can. For the fun And so most of the corps we see are responding to these three decks, not the next set of runner decks we're going to talk about. Uh, the APOC Tau basically is following the same idea as the APOC Lou, but you don't have all of the Anarch synergies that Lou does. So instead you have the fact that Shaper just has a lot of kind of foundational econ in Creative Commission, Diesel, and VRcation. Um, so you're using all of those tools. Uh, and then the other big tool you have is Ingolo. Uh, Ingolo is like the best AI breaker you could want because it doesn't actually, or it's not actually the best AI breaker you could want. That's Amakua. Um, one day we'll ban Amakua and I'll be happy. Um, but only somewhat joking there. Uh, Angolo is a really powerful card. Um, it's very expensive to use and very expensive to install, but it solves a lot of problems for Shaper um, and has been propping up the faction for a while. Um, and here we see, you know, Chris Ferg and Scry, the Snare Bears in the process, ended up on somewhat dissimilar lists. We see, you know, both both are have the same core, like mostly same core stuff of Aesops, Daily Casts, Sure Gambles, VRCations, Diesels, and Creative Commissions, and Apocalypses. But we see, you know, the Snare Bears are on sort of, I'm going to call it traditional Shaper Rig, using self-modifying code, um, and, um, you know, stuff like Telework Contract, and Dirty Laundry, and Out of the Ashes, and they're going to use Out of the Ashes as sort of their way to aggressively land early Apox, whereas the process is saying, we're going to use stuff like Mayfly, we're going to use Ikas, we're going to run three Harbingers and run get more of our Econ that way. Compared to the Snare Bears, they're using Telework Contracts, and those are sort of the the swap the slot swaps that you would be looking at here. Um, and then also, you know, one Overclock versus three Overclock. Uh, this Overclock actually looks very odd to me because the Snare Bears are the ones with self-modifying code, which I think of as the way to get guaranteed value out of your Overclocks. And then the New World Order throws a curveball on us and it is running a Sunny deck. And I think Herbart Klopstock is just like one of the canonical Sunny player and has done really well in the, with Sunny in very large tournaments. Um, and one of the cool things about this Sunny deck is it's fast. It is on three Amakua as its primary breaker. And then Security Nexus, once it gets it and gets the money going, um, and the nice synergy with Amakua and Jack Sinclair basically means you can always run archives for a virus counter, um, unless the CVS ends up there. Uh, and then this deck just drips a lot. It's got three Rizekis and three data foldings. And then it will also get Dream Nets, and it can get the Dream Net on the Jack Sinclair clickless run. So it can click, you know, it can easily make uh, seven credits and draw a card at the start of the turn which is wild. That's a, that's a lot of value and a lot of late game inevitability. The other card that's really smart and really makes sense in this meta is White Hat, which allows you to, to disrupt any combos that the corp is building up in HQ. 
um, and this is a big part of the deck. And then also uses Boomerang and Gachapon, Boomerang to be aggressive, Gachapon to dig for key pieces, and it's got lots of duplicates that it doesn't really mind removing from the game. So it'll be interesting to see how this fares. I think Sunny, right now, like this list to me looks like if you're going to run a mini faction list and try to do well, this looks stronger to me than any of the Atom lists I've seen in the mini faction world. Um, so maybe give this a shot. I will say I think you're probably better off making some kind of shaper list. Okay, so these are the runners that all these teams built, primarily in response to precision design and the sports combo list. Um, and so now we're going to see what the rest of the corps are doing because no one could agree. It you know there's very little agreement on what the rest of the corps look like. So each team to bring a CTM. CTM is probably never going to die because its ID ability is just so permanently relevant. But we see very different things. Um, so both the snare bears and the process are on an archive memories boom as the as one of their major payoffs for tag punishment. But then the Process New World Order are also using the Exchange of Information and Psychographics package as an, either as an additional or as their only tag punishment. Um, and you'll see, you know, this Psychographics means that both the Process and the New World Order want to run Beals, whereas the Snare Bears don't want to run Beal because it's they're, it's just going to be a bl it's a blank three two for them, and they'd rather have cards with text on them like Cyberdeck Sandbox. AR Enhanced Security, 15 Minutes, and Tomorrow's Headline. We see the New World Order is on Amani Sinai, but no one else is. I always think of Amani Sinai as like one of the quintessential CTM cards, but it's, uh, you know, these other teams felt like it was a little bit, I guess, win more. Um, so Arabat Yatek, I think of as the quintessential CTM win more card, but the Snare Bears felt like it was worthy of a slot. Commercial Bankers Group was for the long time, like always where you saw influence for CTM, but only the process is running it. Everyone else is on a bunch of HB influence. So New World Order is running MCA austerity policies as their like big splash in CTM. So they want to say, I'm going to play a two click corp against your three click runner. Um, and I think I'm going to come out ahead because I have hard hitting news, which will give you four tags and I will come out ahead on that exchange. And, you know, eventually, if you don't deal with the MCA, I get to score a Bologna from hand, which is a huge tempo win. Um, the process, you know, uh, it, another thing to note between these lists is how different the asset count is, 15 to 24 and 23. So the process is building much more of sort of a glacier. I'm going to build a board. I'm going to use Mumbed Virtual Tour to protect my assets in addition to my ice. Uh, or I'm going to use fewer assets, but I'm going to protect them better with Mumbad Virtual Tour and with Ice, though you can't protect Bankers Group with Ice, um, but the Mumbad Virtual Tour should make up for that. Whereas New World Order and Snare Bears are going for more of, um, I think it's often called an internet-style CTM, um, but you can also think of it as an NEH style, where you're putting out a lot, there are going to be turns where you just install three new remotes, um, and you're trying to build tempo against the runner that way by make, getting value out of those asset installs uh, faster than the runner can handle them. Um, there's also some really interesting differences in ice. Um, Snare Bears basically only went to tracing ice, which makes some sense with their Arabatia techs. Uh, and then the process in New World Order have some pretty significant overlaps between their lists. But even these CTM lists, you know, they're all you're gonna how you would play against these at the runner is a little bit different in all of these cases, um, which I think is a really interesting thing that each of these while every team said yes CTM is good they all said in a slightly different way. So, all right. So moving on from the CTM lists, we are now going to the Wayland portion of the of the set. So um, we have analyzed Chris on the outfit. We have uh, Lost Geek playing Belt to Last, and Leech Road also playing Belt to Last. But all three of these decks are doing slightly different things. So this uh, fake Titan outfit list is much, you know, is doing two things at once. It's both having an Audacity and Biotic Labor plan to score any of its four three twos, and hopefully score enough of them that it can just score a hostile takeover to win the game. Um, and it has, you know, some nice little ice for handling that. And also, because it's the outfit and it can make a ton of money with by playing too big to fail several times throughout the course of the game, it will also use hard-hitting news and a single 
high profile target to try and close out the game. We can compare that to Lost Geek's uh, Trust the Pencil Built to Last. Um, you know, this has the same number of agendas, but they're sort of. Uh... Oh, this is just a miss. There's actually nine agendas in here. This number on the top is just wrong. Uh, I'll have to uh, complain to Vesper. Um, but uh, it's just got this very nice agenda suite, um, and the goal is basically to kind of run the precision design list, but in built to last. So you still have a nice 40 card deck, you have anaesthetic voids to make the remote very annoying, and you've got a nice, you know, you've got a taxing, but not too expensive ice suite. You've got access to as many border controls as you can legally put in the deck, um, and sort of just going from there. And then finally, the process ended up on the third very different Wayland deck, which is also in Built to Last, again has nine agendas, but instead of using Global Food Initiative, like the other two, uses City Works Project. Um, this, combined with Dedication Ceremony, allows them to very quickly make it unfeasible for the runner to go and steal. Then, they will eventually draw one Neurospike, and then either draw the second Neurospike or a Malapert Data Vault, score the city works project and then click the neurospike click you know play neurospike either archive memories to neurospike again or use the malapert data vault search for the neurospike and play two neurospikes dealing six damage which as we've seen none of the runners are teched for this should flatline all the runners with net damage one thing that we saw in the city works neurospike decks for a long time was punitive counter strike uh, presumably to handle the case where the runner did steal your city works project and we're not seeing it here and I think that's a really interesting choice presumably it's because they don't they didn't put that much money in this built to last deck um, but it'll be an interesting thing to kind of watch out to see how it plays in practice because um, you know if maybe the runner can find a way to to access and steal your city works project this list looks pretty fragile but I also think it's not too hard to cost the runner so many uh, cars that it really is a pretty big tempo swing in your favor, even if they do manage to somehow steal the City Works project. Now we're finally going to go to the last set of decks, and all of these are different. Um, we have NWE is running a sports mill list that is reminiscent of the one that um, the Snare Bears is running, but very it looks very different to me. It's got 14 ice instead of 5, which is a huge deal. It's got 2 audacity instead of 3. It's been influenced on IP block and predictive planogram, um, uh, and that's basically actually where the audacity influence, I think, is going. Um, and I think it's going to be... It's a little more glaciary. It's a little more fair. And I, I, you guys maybe can't see the air quotes I'm putting around it, but it, you know, it's trying to play something that more resembles a game of Netrunner that you would show someone in startup or in their first game or whatever, but still has all the advantages of having a very annoying or frustrating agenda suite where it's full of one pointers that are worth more than one point to the corp or a three pointer that's worth zero point to the runner for most of the game. Uh, Snare Bears is running a very different ace list though. They're running their sports metal, their ice list sports metal, and then this hard hitting news ace list. With the idea being it's just going to out tempo you, rush, 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 and then if you try to keep up, it says, oh, but you didn't pass the economy check. I'm going to fully operational, make sure I get my hard hitting news, make sure I have the economical lead, and boom. Well, literally, boom. Um, and then we have the process, which is ending up with Neuro Hubless, which I have honestly very little idea how this is going to play out. This to me seems like a very kind of historical, classic style of Neuro Hub, where you've got 24 assets, you're just going to spam them out across the board, drawing cards, making tempo every time you do that. Um, and like the CTM lists, it's running three hard hitting news because that card is so important to defining NBN. It's running a one of exchange of information and a one of psychographics so that those tags matter. But it's also running two anoetic voids um, to help it sort of end the run and use its aggressive draw to quickly rush out the runner. And it also is going to use a Mani Sinai to help disrupt the runner's tempo. Uh, it's an unusual looking list to me. The one of Cyberdeck Sandbox seems very odd to me. 
Um, but it looks like a very solid list. It'll be interesting to see how it fares against all the apocalypse that's going around, uh, how it would fare against Hive Mind Max. Because when I look at this list as Hive Mind Max, I think, oh, I can disrupt a lot of this ice very easily, and these assets either don't matter or I could trash with Imp. Um, but Amandi Sinai is really, really good if you can score when Max is low on credits, because you can bounce the progenitor, which trashes the Hive Mind and really sets back that whole game plan. But I've been rambling for almost 35 minutes now, um, so I'm going to wrap up this video. I'm really excited to see these uh, three teams fight each other. Uh, it's a great way to get some snapshot of what the best corp decks are, and while this isn't a super extensive coverage of why the meta is the way it is, um, hopefully you can start to see that a little bit as you look through these lists yourself. Uh, hopefully you found this video good. In insightful. If you want me to talk about or play some of these decks in a future video, please let me know in the comments below. Um, and thank you for watching.